I'm going to start with uh, some just like messing, because we don't understand probability, right? So I just want to make that absolutely clear. Maybe you're some kind of probability savant, but that's not really the case. We're pretty good. That we, we have occasional people who can count how many matchsticks there are on the floor, right? That sort of <coughs> seems to be within our realm of whatever. And we, we understand some kinds of probability, you know, playing sports, whatever. People can do some pretty interesting things, <coughs> anticipating and so on. I mean, we're not terrible at prediction, but <coughs> some kinds of probability, we, our brains just don't work, right? So a uh, couple of classic uh, questions, and I'll... <coughs> Talk about the, the 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 child born on the Tuesday one in the next couple of slides, but the Monty Hall pro problem, right? So is this something that's in your minds? This is a famous problem, yeah. So let me just it's more co the show is more complicated, but the 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 game essentially that um, you know because it could be messed with. You're uh, presented with three doors, right? You know this one, yes. three doors, and behind two of those doors are goats. Good old goats. Goats are great. You know, it's a good thing to win. But another one is a car. So this is sort of, and it's America, so everyone wants a car, right? So you're supposed to think of the goats as bad, right? Uh, <laughs> some people would be like, I want the goat, right? So we just want to be clear on that. The goats are not the thing to choose. So uh, the setup is you choose one of the doors, one, two, three, and they're randomly assigned, right? You choose one of the doors. And uh, the next step is the compare or whatever opens one of the other doors that you haven't chosen and shows you a goat. Right, and then says, "Do you want to change? Right? Do you want to? Do you want to stay? There's no money involved at this point. It's just like, do you, do you just want to change? Right? It's not like doubling the bed or two cars or anything. Do you want to change? And you know, I know many of you have heard of it, but the instinctive feeling is like it shouldn't matter. Right? Right? That's sort of a standard gut reaction. And when this first became a well-known sort of famous problem, it was asked a lot in job interviews. You know, this is sort of early on." Like even before Google started to ask all these things about manhole covers, like why are they round? It was all, this is probably gone by now, I think. Like I don't think you have to worry about this. At some point they started to put up billboards with cryptic Unix things on them and you know, that no one could even understand it was a billboard from Google, right? I mean, it was just some hieroglyphics. And then you had to like you know, do some coding and get on the team <coughs> and then do evil things in the world. But um, anyway, so... Uh, the, this, 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 you know, it's very famous because it is, it is something that upsets people. Uh, and famously, I think it's Marion von Savant, right? So she's a puzzle kind of person, super high Q, IQ story, right? That kind of thing where it's like, you know, the IQ is like 190 or something and they get to write puzzles. And I think she worked for either Parade magazine or something like that. And she would have puzzles and people would, you know, try to answer them or whatever. And she put this one in. And then gave the answer, and then got all these all this mail, which was then became public, you know, printed of it, including from statistics professors explaining how she was wrong, she was an idiot, da 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 da, da. really bad. I mean, just really bad. I mean, statistics professors got this wrong, um, and and wrote letters, you know, to, well, anyway. So the thing is, it's uh, two thirds, right? So there's a two thirds chance the car will be in the other one because you've had this. Um, <coughs> Well, let's just do it. And it's easy to, <laughs> I'll, I'll mess it up like an idiot. But here are the three possible worlds, right? So it could be, um, you know, there's door one, two, and three. Is this showing up? And then, uh, you know, it's goat, goat, and um, car, right? I went, I should draw a, I should draw a goat. Um, anyway, it's got little horns in it, right? So there's um, <laughs> and a tail. So these are the three possible things. And these are equal chances as you, as you enter into this world, right? There are funny things happen on that show where they would do other, you know, that didn't make it quite as clean as this um, car. And then, and there's three card Monty. I watched, once watched my um, aunt get totally taken for a ride on um, Fifth Avenue. It was fantastic. Um, the key thing was she wasn't playing. Someone else was playing. And then the guy said, well, what do you think? You know, you want to put some money on it? And she's just, she's like, oh, this is fine. Like, I'm not playing. But she was playing. And um, usually someone else changes the cards when you're not watching. So, uh, so, so these are the three possibilities, right? So, and if you say, you know, you're going to choose one, right? So one third of the time you're right. And in this case, the person revealing the other door has free choice. But if, you, if we're in these worlds, they have to re either reveal this goat or this goat. So they're forced. 
Like it feels like when they open that other thing and they just show you a goat, like, you know, they're not imparting information to you. But if you step back and see the parallel worlds, you go, you know, maybe that's, that's the thing we can't do quite as easily, right? Is run the parallel timelines in our heads. Darkest timeline situation, right? So uh, they're actually, two of these cases, they are forced to reveal the goat uh, and, and the car is in the other one. So you should always switch. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel <coughs> easy to understand. Like it's not easy to intuit. Anyway, it's a famous example of that. And as I said, lots of people go wrong and famously statistics professors. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so um, this is uh, just a, as I, I, you know, radio lab, some of the old radio lab is good. And this is just a nice little piece. Benford's law we'll come to later on. This is why you shouldn't cheat on taxes. There are other reasons for not cheating on taxes, but this is also um, a good reason. We're not very good at making up random numbers. Okay, so uh, this is a, a really nice piece, uh, and it has, uh, it leads off with how babies tend to do better with logarithmic scales, and then we force the whole counting business on top. And there are groups of people in the world who don't have counting systems, but will distinguish between like 1 and 10 and 100 in a kind of an even way, which is very interesting. So anyway, we, we get the counting in, and then we forget about log scales, so we'll, we'll lose it a little bit. Dunning-Kruger effect, I'm just going to mention it, because you should all know about that. You should totally know about this. If you don't know about this, you must look it up. It's very disturbing. Then you think, ha, 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 everyone else has it. And then you realize you have it, and then you forget about it. Okay, so that's what I'm going to suggest you do. <laughs> okay, so this is the, uh, this is the, so this is a question that sort of had that same kind of flavor of the multi hole problem that was asked, I think, again, at a statistics, this was a statistics conference of, not, not that long ago, someone just got, got up and said, hey, here's a little puzzle for you, for you people. Uh, so this is very upsetting to people. I mean, I get, I've, I, I've had some students just like erupt into, just, just blow up in flames mentally, send angry emails and stuff. But so I'll do what I can to frame this in a, um, in a way that hopefully is clear. So parent has two children, and we're going to assume there's not, they're not twins uh, that... Uh, there's a 50-50 chance of boy-girl, just right? So you can imagine you can do it with coins if you want. So here's a simple question. What's the probability that they're both girls and they're born separately? One-fourth, right? So we're good at that, quarter-quarter. And that's, this is a, I mean, and again, it's if you can start to think of these timelines, right? So girl-boy, boy-girl, boy-boy, girl-girl, right? And these are parallel things. And there's a whole population of uh, people and sort of a quarter of a chance of each of those things happening. All right, so the next one is you've got, Parent has two children, we know one of them is a girl. So what's probably that both children are girls in that case? You want to be one half? So let's... All right, so yeah, so it could be, so if you're going down in orders, right, so it could be you have girl, and then girl, and then boy, the girl. These are these parallel worlds. I guess I'm drawing them the other way. Um, go boy, and then boy, boy, right? So this one's out. We're just not in this group. That, that's not part of our you know, condition now. So these now have a, a third of a chance of happening, right? Okay? So that's, you know, if we can think of these parallel worlds, yes. Like you don't like this? They never, they, never say order matters. they never say order matters? They See, here's the truck. This is starting. Okay. <laughs> no! <laughs> Table's over. Yes. There's a table for you. I put that table in front of you. Grab a table, people. Okay. So there, I think there are things you want to add to it that when none of those things are said, you have to assume the most general case. And that's what, that's what, because you can add little extra conditions that, that change in all sorts of directions. And that's where you see a lot of the upsetness that came after this, you know, and written, you know, people writing things about it. It's like, well, you know, if it was this, but that's not being said, right? It's just left like this. Or, <laughs> I, but you feel, so what, what's the, 
I don't know. I don't. I know. I don't want to. Yeah. They, well, well, let, let, let him say what he wants to say. Yeah. Right. Doesn't say that. Yeah. yeah, one of them is a girl. You have to like you have to get back to this picture and say, well, okay, so this is this is that's all that that means. Right. right. But I think I think the thing is, yeah, you can kind of go off in a different direction because you're trying to add um, quite reasonably. Yeah, yeah, and your brain gets upset. You're good. Yeah. Right. Okay, so there's that. And then, so there's a quarter, a third, and then, so this one. So we have two children, and we know one of them is a girl born on a Tuesday. So what's the, what's the problem that both children are girls? <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> I know what you've been doing. So, um, so, and what about this one then? So this is a question for the assignment. The thing is with, uh, this one is a question for the assignment, and I guess this one is too, but the, the, the nice thing is trying to, you can, you can sort it out, you can get the answer, which is, we now know, is close to a half, which is the weird thing, right? That's the, like we've got to a third, and then you, you, add, this, you add this condition on top, and people's reaction, the default reaction, maybe not for you guys, but the default reaction, at least in this conference, was it doesn't matter, like it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't affect, it's still, right? Should, that, that was the feeling, but it, it, cha it, it changes a lot. Because now you sort of have three types. You have a girl not born on a Tuesday, a girl born on a Tuesday, and a boy. So you actually separates it into a more complicated thing. But being able to then get it to a point where you can kind of see that in a really clear way and maybe tell someone in a really clear way, that was, that's a good exercise. You know, these other little drawings we did, I think, are kind of okay for what we've done, but this is getting... It's a little bit further out. So how do you make this, how do you get it to a point where you could kind of intuit a question like this in the future? You could blurt out 1327s. But what you might be able to say is, well, it's kind of closer to a half. Like that would be the, right, that's a feeling you would want to be able to get out of this. Yeah. All right. So it's, a, it's I, I, pretty charming when this came along. I, it really up, upset people. Okay, so who knows? Well, all right. Thank you. All right, so we right, so we're going to talk about pile size distributions, and these are this is an attempt to summarize your uh, estimates, right? So once again, let me say exactly what this was again. I really want you to understand this, right? Because it didn't all didn't work completely. So we're going to take everyone in the U.S. and we're going to order them from the wealthiest to the least wealthy, and you could order them in different ways, depends what. But we'll put this is something we'll do in general ranking, right? So we're going to have number one wealthiest down to the poorest. Um, which is complicated with debt, right? So the poorest could actually be someone in horrible debt, but um, and they tend to oscillate very strongly. But that's, yeah, often left out of this. All right, so that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to take the first 20% of those people and add up all of their wealth, right? And then the next 20%, and the next 20%, and then the last 20%, add up all of their wealth. And what fraction of the total wealth do those different quintiles contain? Right, so you might imagine, you know, there's some distribution dying off like this, with the numbers of people across here and it's dying off, you know, what's the area under the curve here? What's the area under the curve? Right. Uh, so this is what you guys thought, collect, you know, th these are your estimates as best as I could. Um, there was one I couldn't figure out what the numbers were, but um, these, these are your estimates, right? So <coughs> I've ordered them. Have I tried to order these? You yeah. know, I get, yeah, I've ordered them by the first quintile. So, so one, one issue here is that the, First quintile has to be at least 20, right? So if everyone has the same amount of money, it's going to be 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. And if you've got a person who has all of the biscuits, then it's just going to be like they have all the biscuits. And uh, the, top, the, 20, the top quintile will look like it's got 100%. And then 0, 0, 0. So they were the limits. So this can't happen. So this is just something I want, want you to reflect on if this was a stumbling block for you. You can't actually... They can't increase, right? Because it was ordered from wealthiest to, to least wealthy. So, okay, that's not going to work. Some of these didn't add up to 100. Okay, right. <laughs> I mean, there are a few tiny errors. Okay, so up the top, we have, you know, everyone has all the, the money, right? That's the, in, the, in the, the wealthy bin, right? The top quintile has everything. That's what this was. And there might have been some po people put in 0.001 and stuff like that. 
So this is, these are pretty drastic situations, right? And then this is, this one's not quite working, but down here, this is, this is beyond Sweden and, um, I mean, wealth is complicated in the Scandinavian countries, I suppose, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. And then, so that's a lot of blue here. So this is a fair, you know, this is a wide range. And then this is your ideal, right? So this, this is the, everyone gets the same, everyone has the same amount of money as this little line here, right? Everyone has 20, 20, 20. Uh, some glitches here as well. Uh, <coughs> but then, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely pulled back this way, a long way. So you're a bunch of rampaging socialists. <laughs> not, not everyone. <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> not everyone, because some people think, you know, this is good, and, and <laughs> I am going to be here. That's the aspiration, right? So you want that structure, so you can enter into the Ponzi scheme that is capitalism, because <coughs> you'll win. So this is the past, right? I've, if I can flip between this, you know, a little... Actually, last, last time around, though, I think they were a little more severe. If you look on the left, right, there's a little more of the blue out there. And um, ideal, similar kind of socialist madness. But people have been pretty good and pretty varied over the, over the years, right? So a bit of everything. There's always an economist in the room who has a certain sense of these things. But I think people have, have developed a stronger view of how this works, although you can see still, you know, we're still really all over the place, right? This is... Okay, all right, so let's see what is really the case and what this stemmed from. It's just a fun little exercise. While well, the projector is dead, Pratchett is doing well, he's getting more fur on him, um, <coughs> which is his job. Okay, okay, so we're going to talk about this. I'll connect back. I just wanted to sort of put that out there because probability is tough for us, uh, and you've got to work at it, right? You've really got to work at it to develop an intuition. Okay, so um, this is the wealth distribution piece, and, and so you did this, right? These are the extremes. Money is belief. And so this is, this is then, now this is from a study. So it's back in 2011. It's Mike Norton and Arely. Uh, and so they surveyed a bunch of people, and this is what they uh, came up with for their quintiles, right? So and this is averaged over all of them. And I had the averages at the top of those things, but those bars were pretty small. So this is the actual, and this is for 2000, I think, the US in 2007 or 8, right? So it's not up to date. I tried to find some new data, but I couldn't really get to it um, very easily. So that would be nice to find some. So this is the actual data uh, state of the US. So the top, this is uh, 190, right? So it's close to 84% maybe uh, of the wealth is owned by the top 20, or was at that point. The next 20% uh, had about 10% of the wealth and the, the third 20%, maybe less than, maybe 4%. And then the bottom 40% are here. That's their line, right? So relatively, they don't, they're, they're off the thing. So even the ones, even you guys who had the most drastic ones probably didn't get the bottom 40. Well, most, some of you did, right? Not, not in, uh, not shown, basically. Uh, and these are the estimated ones. So people were, you know, they, they understood it was skewed, but this is a fair way off. This chunk is bigger than this one. This is certainly bigger than this one. And these ones exist, right? So this is the bottom 20% would have maybe 3%. The next 20%, yeah. Is this still a mortgage or a Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder what they did. Yeah. So we'd have to look at the paper to see what they see what the data they used was, was doing. Because debt is a very complicated piece here. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So they never. S so that's been a. That would be a good thing to fix up with it. It just doesn't, right? Which seems super wrong and weird. So. Yeah. Did you look at this study in particular? Or you? You know that in general, that's the way it's done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is what they did. It would be assets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we can look up the paper, but um, <laughs> let's take all this time. Um, I'm saying wealth, you know, it's going to be a little complicated. Right. 
Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at that properly. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't make that much well, I mean, it, it is a. It, it you're, no, you're right. It's a big. It is a big. Big issue. I mean, debt's just not. See, a lot of these, these these size distributions really, you know, they need things to be greater than zero as well, right? So there's a problem with negatives. Okay, what's it say? Well, let's look at it later on to see because they must have done something with negative, right? Because I don't know if they. Yeah, so. I don't know if they did that. If people are like underwater on their mortgage, that's a negative. Yeah. There's no value to that. Yeah, it's a. If they owe less than the property's worth, that's a positive asset. All right. Well, let's, let's move on. We'll see if we can figure this out properly um, later on. But this is. This, so these are the estimated ones, and these are the, this is the, what people thought was the ideal. So the really interesting thing, I think, is on the next page. So this, the ideal, of course, is really ridiculously even, you know, this is not Scandinavia, this is beyond Scandinavia, I think. You know, this is just not something that happens in natural systems where money is involved. Um, if it was like, you know, actual physical things, it might be harder. But this is, um, well, people were pretty good at getting gold together. Okay, so uh, really, you're yeah, very different. And then there's this, right? So uh, they separate our people by uh, their um, income here, uh, whether they voted for Bush or Kerry. So this was 2004, 2000, yeah, 2004 was sort of the last time they had a vote for them. Uh, men versus women. Uh, and then here, so these are the, actually again at the top, these are the estimated ones, and then the same groupings with their ideals. And so the interesting, thing here, right, is that they're really pretty consistent across these different groups. They, they skew in ways that make some sense, right? So the wealthier people tend to have a little bit more of a skew this way. Uh, maybe, you know, Republican voters were a little, um, actually, that, this is their estimated, right? So that's a bit funny. The, uh, the Democrats think it's worse. Uh, but when it gets to what they think should be right, um, it goes the other way. Although, you know, these are basically, you know, not very different. And it's, it's, a, it's a funny question to ask. The quintile thing you know, pushes people, generally pushes their view of things, maybe their political views away a little bit, and they're just trying to figure out something that's a bit odd. Um, but yeah, remarkable consistency, really, across what you might think could be different groups of people. OK. So hard things to understand, although you did pretty well. All right, so let's talk about power law size distributions. These are going to be um, you know, uh, abstracted pure things. Uh, we'll have a continuous one and a discrete one. And in general, we're just going to start with this sort of thing, right? So we'll have some decaying power law for the probability of something. X to the minus gamma, we're going to have this, uh, we'll use gamma a lot. Gamma is greater than one, which is a little simple question you have, I think, in your assignment. As to why that is, there's some minimum of X and some maximum. And so we're going to make it very uh, simple in this kind of abstract way, right? And so that means, and of course, distributions don't really look like this, but you know, here's our you know, x and p of x, and there's going to be this, it's going to have some shape like this. As we've seen, as you'll see, the, these distributions don't look like this really, but this is x min, I think in your, and x max, right? And this is b in the assignments, and that's it. That's the idea. And so this, this is scaling as c to the x to the minus gamma. Right. Lots of just di natural distributions appear in the world. Gaussians, exponentials, they have good stories for them. I mean, famous ones, central limit theorem, you know, is one of the great achievements of human thinking. Um, exponentials come about from failure mechanisms. You know, these are very natural things. So these, these, these kinds of distributions appear everywhere. I'll call them the statistics of surprise because uh, they are underlying lots of things like earthquakes and, you know, and the extent that they really match them is, you know, up for debate. But these very skewed distributions, heavy tail distributions is what they're called. Uh, what, what can happen is you get lots of things that are small and eventually some really incredibly big things. And it depends all on this exponent, right? Okay. 
So that's our basic setup. We'll have a discrete version as well. Let me do that, and then oh, we better do that. Yep. <coughs> I have to do this. Does that work? Oh, yeah. Okay. At some point I have to use it. Okay. <laughs> um, Bagro first got one of these and he used it at a conference, and apparently, and he's just sort of like, just, you know, chilling along, and he's like, and then apparently the whole crowd just went, <gasps> <laughs> 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 it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and he just kept it cool. He loved it. Uh, okay, so lower, lower cutoff and upper cutoff. Right, right. That's the idea. These are the terms we'll use. We'll just call them cutoffs, right? This is uh, often used in physics. Okay, so what happens with this is we 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 claim that these, I'm sort of saying these distributions are everywhere in the world or something close to them. And the way we tend to look at them is in log space. And we use log 10 because of the human thing. Um, and so log 10 of px on the left-hand side, and then we're just going to log 10 of this thing, so we get our log 10 of a constant because this is a product, and then the minus gamma comes out the front, right? We're adding these pieces together, and the minus gamma comes down here. So now in log log space, this quantity is a linear function of this quantity, and it's got a minus gamma as the slope. So there's a, log, there's a big game of fitting these things. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit of uh, uh, how we can fit them in better ways by looking at kind of an integral of this, and then also Zipf's law, how it's connected completely to Zipf's law, which took a long people, long time for people to realize, maybe 50 years. Okay, use base 10 because we're good people, right? <laughs> and we say it. All right, so usually it's often just the tail, right? There's something funny going on, and it's the tail has this nice power law behavior, which people debate about. <laughs> Uh, so that, that can be true. People will still say it's a power law size distribution. Very excited about it. And it's a, uh, you'll, you'll hear these terms, you'll see this is just generally in uh, fat tailed or heavy tailed, right? So exponentials are thin tailed, they don't have much of a tail on them. Uh, Gaussians are e to the minus x squared, right? They die away really quickly. Uh, but these, right, these, these are getting smaller, but it turns out that they get smaller in, in such a slow way that, um, that there's there's material out there that matters. So there are other of these heavy tail distributions, log normals are kind of in that category, Weibull distributions, and you know you could certainly have a situation where you're making a mistake and it's really one of these things. So lots of arguments about which distribution in this system is really exhibiting, and then of course you want to get to the mechanisms for why that distribution is there. Right, that's the big game. So show you a number of examples. Uh, word frequency, so you can have discrete, sorry, discrete size things, so it could be word frequency, so you take Moby Dick and you count how many times each word appears. So generally in English, the will be maybe three or four percent of all words in a text, right? So, uh, and these are pretty skewed, they're weird things, right? So the, of, and, an, a, about six words will comprise 20 percent of a text, and about 150 words will comprise half of the text. Right, so we have the text, Moby Dick, and then we have the lexicon for Moby Dick, right? So the dictionary for Moby Dick. These are all the unique words that appear in there. And half of this list will only, those words will only appear once. Hapax legomenon, they will only appear once. That's generally true. It's a very odd thing that language, uh, and it's of course across all, all different languages that, that this sort of structure is there. We have these very rare words that in sufficiently large corpora we use, you know, one time in a book, say. Uh, and it's to the extent, yeah, and there'll be, a, so a half of the words will appear once, a sixth of them will roughly will appear two times, and so on. And then you get up to words like the that appear all over the place. So there's an odd thing, if you're a journalist, sometimes you get paid per word, right? So my wife's a financial journalist. And you know, if you get a dollar a word, this is a good thing, or two dollars a word. But, you know, 20% of that, the pay you get will be for writing the and of and 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 a, yeah. Doesn't matter how long the words are, right? Yeah. Got to count up some way, right? So, uh, okay, so these are just examples. Uh, so no degree in networks, number of friends, right? This is one of the big, the network science, which we'll get to later on, started about 20 years ago, and, and a big piece of it was starting to look at social networks. Hyperlinks, right? So links on from web pages to other web pages, that was another big piece. So citations for articles, court decisions, like so Supreme Court decisions. How many decisions in the future cite this 
court case and how many does it cite going back. Same sort of thing for, for science, all of knowledge. You know, in this case, we'd, we'd a really a good place connecting these things together is Wikipedia, right? Where all the links like between pages on Wikipedia. And we had a, a paper come out of this course that um, it's, there's this sort of th this, this notion that if you follow the first link on every page on Wikipedia, you end up at philosophy. I don't know if you if you heard this. So you can just do this for fun, right? Um, so f the first link kind of in the body of the text, right? So a student tested that out. And it's pretty much true, actually. There are some little cycles you get stuck in, like names of saints or something like that. You can get trapped. Uh, but mostly, it, yeah, and it's you can see it just sort of goes up and up and up and more abstractly into you know, bodies of thinking and so on. And in the time we looked, the snapshot we looked at, I think there was like reason and um, like reality and experience. There was a number of words. There was a little cycle of six words that just went round and round and round. You know, it depends what has been going on with editing. Anyway, that's a that's a fun thing to do. But there is this whole structure of knowledge. You know, what's it like? Okay, so in that case, we're going to say the probability of k. This is this is now. A, it's just a right. So k is one, two, three, four. Um, it doesn't work for k equals zero. Certainly, you can have, as I said, it's really about the tail of the distribution. You you can certainly have that. Th this is true for for large k, and it has some structure. You know, there are actually pages with no no links or um, people with no friends or whatever it is, right. which is not. That's a sad thing. Sad sad pages and people. All right. So, uh, as I said, uh, words are a good example. This is a from from uh, the UK. A collection of words. It's a bit of a weird one because they've stuck together over time. Newspaper articles, people talking on radio, all sorts of sources of text, and just kind of glued them together without any sense of whether they were popular or not. Yes. Yeah, the Zips Law thing. Yes, yes. And then we'll get to it later on. But there was a lot of debate over a long period of time as to whether it meant anything, right? So at some point, and this paper is really this is how one of these papers is framed. Monkeys typing at a at a keyboard, which is us really, but you know, like the no <laughs> the notion that they're just texters, right? Uh, you know, there's this sort of funny notion, Borgesian kind of notion that you know Shakespeare would Shakespeare's works would appear at some point by enough monkeys typing. Um, but uh, there was a there was a paper that claimed that that would give rise to a Zips law, right? Just random random bashing away and hitting a space bar now and then. So there's a paper in the 2000s that has to refute that, right? That, I mean, it's, this has been going on for a long time. It says, you know, it's like, no, mo monkeys typing it is not, does not give you Zips law. Um, but there, like, it, as to exactly why, it's a big piece we'll talk about because there's a balance between whether it's an optimization thing, you know? Uh, you could have specific words for absolutely everything, uh, but that, that would be pretty cumbersome. It would re require an enormous amount of encoding and decoding. Or you could have this, uh, you could just have ook, right? And then there's a lot on the decoder, right? So we started to add more words at some point, and, and yeah, the evolution has been very interesting to kind of consider. All right, but we'll get to it. It's a good question. This is uh, from Jonathan Harris, who we're a fan of in lots of ways, who actually grew up partly on Shelburne Farms. He's part of the Shelburne Farms people, the webs. Uh, and he's an artist scientist. You could look up his stuff. He's done all sorts of super fantastic things. We had him here as an uh, artist in residence for a while. Anyway, so he did this thing. This is years ago. And uh, it was, um, I guess, Java, so it's dead. Or Flash, so it's dead now, I think. Uh, but it was a little explorer thing, right? So you could go across here and find all these words uh, from, oh, let, me, let me try it. I'm not sure if it works. Does it still work? No. Maybe it's dead. Yeah, flash, and of course no one wants. Steve Jobs said no. Uh, he had this nice piece on here where it turned out that, you know, just like the Bible code sort of thing, there would be sequences of words, and people would, you know, kind of bring them out because they apparently had meaning, so there was, you know, code in this sort of thing. <laughs> A sneaky thing he did, though, was let people search for words just to see where they are, right? And this thing would you know, zoom along and show you where that word is in, in ranking. And then he looked at what people searched for, and it wasn't, wasn't great. <laughs> it's a little damning. Anyway, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, XKCD, many of you probably know XKCD, which is 
famous for being terribly drawn and interesting. <laughs> um, uh, Gary Larson, does anyone, has anyone ever heard of Gary Larson? So it used to be that Gary Larson cartoons were like everywhere, like every scientist would have their little favorite Gary Larson thing with a cow doing something. Um, but it was kind of old, you know, it's like before information and computers in a way, and he retired and they've kind of gone away. Some very funny things. Anyway, XKCD is the sort of geek cartoon now. But he, he did, he, you know, one of his little expeditions here was to write a, a book explaining things which used only the top 1,000 words from a ZIF distribution, from a, this ranked set of words. And again, you have to choose your corpus, right? You could choose Twitter, take the top 1,000 words used on Twitter, and it's kind of a weird set of words. We'll talk about that later on. Um, you just have RT in there for, and, and, you know, lol and all this sort of stuff. You could use the New York Times, right? You could do different sources. There isn't one, you know, there isn't one sort of ordering of words for any language. You have to define the corpus, which is reasonable. So this one is using the top 1,000, which is pretty limited, right? So this is trying to describe a submarine. So a boat that goes under the sea, you know, works out okay. Uh, and then the whole thing is, and the, even the title, everything in this whole thing is uh, from this very top end of Zip's distribution. The pusher, you know, machines that turn the pusher, right. It's a nice job. Uh, and then you can get, you can, of course, he's making money. Oh, that's good for him. Um, this is a, this is a, a rocket. It's an upgoer five. <laughs> there's, no, there's, there's no rocket in there. So a challenge, you know, we need those unusual words and they have real power and um, value and we know them generally. Uh, I'll come back to some more things about words because we have this uh, great, we have some really fantastic people here at um, UVM when it comes to words. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to one of them. So this is, okay, so let's look at these distributions a little more. So this is a Gaussian, right? This is a fantastic, famous thing. What is the pi doing that? No, I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? This is a great achievement, fantastic. So, um, <coughs> one of the great integrals of all time. So, this is, so here's just a random Gaussian, right? So it's got some mean, some standard deviation um, of one. And this is, and I said we could look at these things on log-log scales. This is, this is a Gaussian on log-log scale. No one would ever do this. It's a bit of a weird thing to do. Log normals are a different thing. All right, but that's just to show you these two pieces. Um, okay, so here's a little thing. Just sketch in the same way, sketch this, right? Sketch this plot for one over x. Use a pencil and paper and sketch, right? Make an x-axis and a probability of x, and then sketch this thing. And the range is x equals 1 to 10 to the 7. <coughs> Just a quick sketch, right? Up to 10 million. You see this down here? I just want you to draw this on the, a book or the surface or a person or in the air or whatever. Um, 1 over x. That's a probability distribution we're looking at here, which isn't really a probability distribution. But it's, a, it's too fat. Tails are too heavy. Too much room. Very special one, 1 over x. And the range is 1 to 10 million, right? That's the thing. You need a 1 and a 10 to the 7. Look at that activity, blood flowing through your brains. Very abusive, really. Eight, 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, <coughs> okay. All right, let's look at that. So this is what it looks like, this sort of thing. Right, so it's just boink. Um, <coughs> so that, you would, you, would, you would think, right, that this is... Nothing is going on out here, right? That this is, so this is actually for words. It's for the brown corpus. Um, this is the normalized frequency of occurrence word W, right? And this is the number of words, number of distinct words that have that frequency. So this is, you know, one divided by the total number. This is uh, words that appear once, and there are a lot of them, as I said. These are This is like the out here. It's a word that appears an enormous amount of times. Right, so number of, uh, so no, so the V appears about, this is a percentage thing, Z, V appears about 6.9% of the time in this corpus, 
And um, so there's only one of there's only one word that appears with that frequency. Now, if you put on log log scale, you see this. So now it starts to what you, it's it's lifting this out, and it still seems kind of amazing that something might happen here. But obviously, v is a very important word. Uh, so now we've got you start to see room on this thing. If you do this with Gaussians and so on, it's not going to work, right? So it starts to look linear. It's a little messy, yeah. But these are all these words that are, appear. There's only one kind of word, one word that has that frequency. These are words for which there are two that appear that number of times, three, and then it slowly goes up. And then we get to these words that appear once. All right, so I'm going to show you there are lots of things that have this kind of behavior. We will get to this one. I will derive it. But this is the number of words that have at least a frequency of usage. And again, this is in percentage. The linear one is no good, but the log-log version is very nice, right? So what we've done is we've taken essentially taken this one and done it with complementary cumulative, right? So we've integrated this way and we've said how many, how many words have at least this frequency of usage. So you're adding up this way, integrating this way. We'll get to that. And that cleans this up and makes a nice power law. The exponent is actually different. Instead of minus gamma, it's going to be minus gamma plus one, which we'll get to. But you can see if you want to do a regression, that's not bad, right? You, we should be able to fit a straight line to this thing Less so this one, right? This is a little bit messy, um, but this is not so bad. All right. Pretty funny. So uh, <coughs> language, yes, lots of language. So, yeah, so sampling is a little hard. And so something we'll get to in a problem set is what happens if you have one of these distributions, you're sampling from it, what happens over time? So normal, normal distributions and other finite variance distributions it fills in, right? You start to see the shape of it, and you've got enough samples. Like, oh, you know, this is what it is. But famously, for these distributions, you know, you double, you you double the amount of time you've been sampling, and then you double again, you double again. Then you, the maximum that you are that you've seen so far keeps growing, keeps growing, right? You get bigger and bigger and bigger things. Uh, maybe I'll have it here, but one one you know one classic example is, and you know, we, wealth is complicated, but if you sample people randomly from the US and look at their height, right? And then plot a little histogram that it fills in. If you sample them and then plot their wealth or start making a histogram of their wealth, it takes a long time. The, the chance of getting Bill Gates or Bezos is very low, right? So it's gonna take a long time, but eventually you would hit them and they'd be like way, way bigger than anything you've seen before. But that happens slowly. You know, you get someone who's got a million dollars and 10 and then 100, and it's the same sort of thing with earthquakes. All right, so this one is uh, earthquakes, in fact, right? This is Gutenberg-Richter law. Uh, we have this um, <coughs> famous, you know, famous law. Uh, so the slope is actually decaying like m to the minus one here for magnitude. There is a cut or a change in scaling that's um, to do with the uh, earth thickness of the Earth's crust, and then there's an overall scaling. This was a weird paper, actually, because it was published twice. That's a naughty, very naughty thing. They just... I got a lot of trouble for that. Um, <coughs> change the author list too. Okay, that was bad. Uh, so, as I said, prediction and knowing how these distributions work is hard. So this is from, uh, you know, this, this terrible uh, tsunami uh, off of Japan, uh, or hitting Japan a few years ago, and right history. The history in Japan, right, for 300 years, there's been nothing like that, and that's many generations of people. Uh, and so, you know, people become more and more relaxed. And I think, yeah, right, this is all this sort of stuff about, so this, this, and it's, you know, I mean, what can you, this is, it's, it's hard to think about these distributions and believe this might happen. We, we try, you know, and of course the tsunami in the Indian Ocean was completely outsized. But from a long-term point of view, they will happen. And, and it's not said here, but uh, there was a, maybe back seven, eight hundred years ago, uh, there were stones put into the ground to show do not build beyond here, right? So there'd been a terrible tsunami, so do not build behind it. And of course, over hundreds of years, eventually people started to, and then they became lost. But uh, that there was an effort to say, you know, to, to help the future generations by putting in something that wouldn't go away. Uh, right? Lots of different things are, are floating around. So this is, this is a bit of an odd distribution. This is actually a cumulative distribution. This is for the um, 
the fractional ingredients that appear in at least K recipes in China. So um, all this data is on the web, right? So you can play around with it, and people have um, done all sorts of interesting things, particularly with 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 recipes, looking at uh, how many how uh, ingredients are shared across different recipes, da da da, lots of things. So that's a funny one, right? So you have things that are, you know, every everything has salt, for example, and then you get more and more exotic ones. All right, so there are, so we're going to talk about this Herbert Simon paper from 1955, very famous paper. We'll go through this. Uh, so he was a political scientist, um, Nobel Prize winner, uh, and it's 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 about the rich get richer process, which we'll see is rediscovered over and over again. But we are now in a point where we collectively, kind of as a whole body of science, know you know know about it. We can all point to the previous studies. Mark Newman, who's at Michigan, had this paper a few years ago, which. Um, Kind of, I'll show you some excerpts of that, but it puts a lot of these power laws together. Uh, and then this is Newman again with Clausette and Shalizi. This is a so they have a, they have some stuff on how to measure these things well, and it's it's used a lot, and, and it's okay, it's okay. So we can get to that. All right, so lots of examples now. Uh, so as we've had word frequency citations to papers, this is hits to websites. Um, number of books sold, right, as a function of, um, you know, different, obviously there are books that sell very poorly and then books that sell fantastically. These little shaded regions are to show that, you know, the scaling isn't great here, but it, the, it's all right out here. Uh, these are calls received. So AT&T was sitting on all this data for a long, long time, and they had pure mathematicians in there, but they never quite got the network story out. It's all sitting there. But again, very skewed. Um, earthquake magnitude, which we've just looked, we've just looked at. Uh, these are, I think, this is intensity should be, um, you know, oh, this is wars. Okay, so these are sizes of wars in terms of fatalities. So skewed distribution, ridiculous ones like crater diameter on the moon. Lots of things of different sizes, but they, you know, the story for a lot of these things is somehow there's a growth process, right? Or a, an agglomeration process. Somehow things can be combined or perhaps there's a fracturing that splits things into pieces of different sizes like lots of tiny ones or some big ones. And that kind of makes sense with this sort of thing. Uh, this is net worth for US people. Um, name frequency, right? So that's a skewed thing as well. Lots of people with I mean, we're kind of ridiculous, right? We tend to give everyone the same name <laughs> with some variation, right? But uh, and then they can be, you know, more and more rare, of course. Lots, but humans are good at using the same name over and over again. And then population of a city. You see, it's not doing very well there. But there's a, this is a famous one, the uh, observation that this is maybe the case for many, many countries. Often this top one sits off, yeah, right. So it's different. London is quite different. Doesn't fit. Yeah, so this is uh, this is debated a lot, right? People get very upset about this, um, but you can do some nice things with kolmogorov smirnov tests, so sort of, which is a fantastic test for comparing two distributions. So, how well does a perfect power law fit this compared to you know various other kinds of construction, log normals, and so on? So you can, you know, you can produce a p-value and so on. What you really want is here's the history of the, and we'll have a couple of examples, the history of this system, how it grew, and does that fit with some mechanism that produces the exponent you see? And, and that can, we can do that. Sometimes you, some papers have done that, some work has done that. Um, but it is, a, it is a big, you know, there's just so many arguments about this, it's unbelievable. Now, I don't think anyone argues about the fact that these are heavy tailed, right? And they are skewed and the exact nature of them. So sampling from this, whether it's exactly a power law or not, has all of these effects, right? The, most of the time you get small things, because again, this is on a log-log scale, which in real normal space looks like this. Most things are small, and then you know, occasionally you get a bigger thing, and then even less, occasionally you're bigger and bigger things, yeah. Okay, how am I doing? <clears throat> all right, lots of examples. These are the actual exponents. Size of cities is more like 2.1, but just to give you a sense of ideas, right? The, the idea of this is ones and twos in these exponents, citations of papers, uh, tree trunk diameters, right? So if you walk into a forest, there's um, a diameter uh, breast height, which is a standard height, so you have to figure out where that is on you, right? 
and you have to go up to your tree and measure your tree. Uh, very good for ecological studies, right? Trees don't run away, so you can do some good work, good work with this. We have old papers on tree distribution size, <laughs> tree sizes. Uh, it's like circles growing. Ridiculous things like this, so the uh, random point in the universe, the gravitational field, um, force at that point. Uh, this, and, and so, lots of funny things. So this is a religious adherence in cults, right? So that has one of these exponents. Now, what's gonna matter? This is sightings of birds. Right? Lots of birds that you know, everyone sees, and there's a couple of rare ones that maybe they make up, but um, you know, we trust birders, the good people. The ones who steal the eggs, then they're, they're messed up. Okay, so um, these exponents, you see where they are, right? So they're, they're between one and three often, and it turns out that between two and three is a very interesting exponent situation because the mean of that distribution is relatively small, uh, but the variance is really large, right? So most of the time you're gonna get small things and then really huge things will occasionally, occasionally pop up. If the exponent's between one and two, then your mean is actually really large and your variance is you know, even bigger. So this is, a, this is an extreme case. Uh, we'll, get, we'll work through a problem which is very, very odd. So if, if, if there's no upper bound, right, if k can be as large as you want, then the mean for this distribution is infinity. Right, and the variance and all the higher moments, it's infinity, right? So that's, that's pretty weird. So the mean size of, if we had a, you know, you know our Earth, could be as big as possible and our cities could be as big as just were unendingly large, then we'd have a, the average size of a cult would be infinite, which is weird. But you know, there's a, there's a limit to this. The, the scaling goes out here and then there's the you know, size of your population. At some point there's seven billion people, right? So what are we, eight, eight billion? Lots of people. So <laughs> between one and two is a pretty crazy exponent. Two and three, also crazy but sneaky. And then above three um, tends to be not as exciting and dangerous. Right. And we live for danger, so we're going to go for, uh, for the one to three category. So one, one example we'll get to that we'll work through is random walks, right? Just a simple thing, right? So random walks, you've got someone who is texting. This is the version I'm going with now. And they're just wandering around. So when I went to college, it was you know, someone who was drunk, obviously. And so um, Australia. So, uh, so you've got someone who's ra randomly, but they're just stepping. So of course, they do it. They live on a grid. There's some little sort of Minecraft thing, and they just step one space at a time. Uh, there's a clock, but they're texting, and they just do this randomly. So they start at some point. What's the probability they come back to that point at any time in the future? Well, so, you know, half the time they just step out and come straight back. Half the time, right? Either way, it's like boom, they're back. So there's a 50% chance they'll be back in two steps. Overall, they will definitely return. They'll always come back, right? So every walker who sort of goes off a little bit this way, texter goes off, they'll always come back. But the average time it will take is infinity, which is really weird. Even though some will take only two steps, some will take four steps, some will take many, many steps, and some will take so long that when you average over all of those things, you get infinity because the probability of returning after 2n steps decays as 2n to the minus 3 halves, right? So it's between 1 and 2. It's minus 1 plus a half there. And that's in this crazy category of um, infinite mean. It's a totally fine probability distribution, but it's infinite mean. All right, um, just to say, lots of, lots of things where we've been measuring exponents and kind of putting them all together. But these are quite different circumstances. I mentioned this quickly, so Taleb, who's a bit all over the place, but uh, this is a famous, this has become very famous, black swans, people make companies with these names. Uh, but he ha has a reasonable thing, he's a very big fan of Mandelbrot, mild versus wild, right? So the mild distributions, Gaussians and so on, versus this kind of exponent up to three situation where, you know, it could be you have large means or, or, or small means, but the variance is, you know, infinite or tied to the upper bound of the system. So this is not a bad framing, mild and wild. And he talks about mediocristan and extremistan. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, black swan. It's a bit, so I, I mean, I have to say this, right? So black swans are in Western Australia. I think this might be a good place to finish. This is his little joke about uh, 
the not being able to predict the future. This is uh, for a turkey, right? Turkey's weight, and um, Thanksgiving occurs here, so um, not so good for turkeys. Uh, anyway, he's really into deadlifts for some reason. Talks about it all the time. So um, okay, so black swans, right? Do you know the story? So black swans are only found in Western Australia. And there was a sort of a saying, I, supp I believe this is true, around London that a black swan was sort of a funny, weird thing that you would never see. Only ever seen white swans. So they get to Western Australia and there are black swans. Now, actually, they've talked about it. They've actually talked about it as a concept, right? They've sort of marked out black swans as something that would be weird, but they've actually conceived of them. Whereas a platypus is clearly the black swan of Australia, right? Like, it's the thing that you come back with. And I believe people came back with them and said, look what I found. And they're like, well, you totally stitched that together. Because we know, you know, Fred did that last week. Because that's what they did. This is the English, right? You know, they're always trying to make their, their claim, get something shown off in one of their museums. You know, the empire has had its sunset. But they, anyway, so um, <clears throat> they are winning the cricket today. Anyway, so uh, it's not that. So it's, I, that's what I'm going to say. It's, it's a terrible framing, actually. It's a terrible framing. But it's stuck. And Black Swan means a thing to people, it means this sort of unexpected surprising thing, although people want 10 every day. Go and find me 40 black swans this week so we can make lots of money. The whole point of it is that these are things outside of your scope that you don't predict and you don't see coming. Anyway, obviously it's a platypus that you should have here. Um, okay, so that's just sort of a setup for things and uh, we'll talk, a, I'll, I'll talk more about these calculations, but hopefully you can get started on the assignment. All right, office hours are now, tomorrow, Thursday. Thank you. Magic box. All right, good. All right, so let's get into this. And I know it would have been good to get to some of these slides the other day, but we did not. So um, power law size distributions, right? So we have this, these things that look good on a log log plot, right? They seem to be straight lines or they're, they're certainly have a nice wide spread out there. As we said, there could be heavy tailed distributions. They don't have to be exactly power law size distributions. Uh, but we have mechanisms that give rise to all of these things and we can test and say, okay, it really is kind of a, a system that's producing a power law as opposed to a log normal. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so you're measuring the power law. How do they So, so a word that's been brought in from that's being brought in from Spanish. How do they say, oh, this makes a cut as a word that's being like if we're losing words, we might be gaining them. Oh that yeah, so that's another thing. Um, words don't tend not to absolutely die, which is interesting, right? They're sort of floating around somewhere. Um, this is about the their conjugation changing. So the words have been there for a long time. It's just that they move from maybe I'm not saying the right thing, but you know so let's say, you know, to buy, right? At some point, we say we bought. At some point, we start to say some, you know, enough kids say I buy it and eventually everyone gives up and they're like, okay. But I guess it's, but let's say that, how, how do you, when you, you go to buy, or let, let's say that had its etymology in a, in a foreign language, but like kids start using it, say? Yeah. How, how do you, yeah. Um, like, like this is, you know, it, it's a foreign, how does it, how do you know, okay, this is, we're including in our, our new English school. Like, because the, the old English mm. has words that are very rare now. I mean, the new English school has presumably words that didn't. Yeah, so, well, well, so, so, but the thing with Google, I guess what I was trying to say with Google is it's introduced, it's regular straight away. Like, it's, the, there's no, okay. yeah. So let's say. It's, because this rule is so dominant now. Like, if you, to introduce an irregular verb, that would be an achievement. So There's some story about quiz being a word that was introduced, right, by, as a game. So it doesn't... Make up a new word. Come no. Other languages and, and no. Okay. No, we really want to impose this. It's so far down this, you know, kind of rabbit hole that we want to actually... Really, we want to impose those rules all the time. And Old English had all these frills attached to things, right? So if you say, you know, the cow... And this is not really true, but the cow jumped over the fence. Like, the, the jumped would have that... it kind of has inside it that it's a cow and there was a, like it has all these other pointers to other parts to the, of, of what you're talking about. 
And collectively, we realized that context would, could do all the work, right? That we could just, you know, sequence things and there's a jump, but you have to listen to everything else and we'll put it all together. But there was extra stuff that we strapped on earlier to sort of like, you know, help convey things properly. No, that's all right. It's good. Words are very frequently introduced in some other languages as well. Like taboo, yeah. Sure. Well, it depends on the language. I mean, English is pretty good at doing that. Yeah, yeah. Pajamas. <laughs> Especially ones that are fun to say. Well, you didn't have, apparently, didn't have pajamas, right? Yeah. But it, this is about verbs, like, you know, what happens when they come in. Uh, discotheque. We gave them weekend, though. Apparently, they didn't have, yeah. And le comping. Anyway, it goes on forever. Uh, <clears throat> right, the French have rules. You're not allowed to use too much English. Right, on a billboard or whatever. This like, yeah, get upset. Uh, ridiculous language, the English. Uh, okay, so this is just some sense of, of what we're talking about here, right? So for the Gaussians, this is just to quickly get this again. Gaussians, the typical member, right? You've got something that's mediocre. It's it's in between. This is this Taleb framing. Uh, so the but. But then the, the black part here is what you have with these parallelized so, um, size distributions. There's no internal scale that matters more than anything else. So either your average thing is a giant thing or a, or a tiny thing. And this depends on the, this exponent being greater or less than 2. We'll come back to that more and more. Um, so there are various other pieces here. Prediction is easy. That's a very important thing. Prediction is hard here. Big surprises happen. Big jumps. Um, yeah. All right. That's OK. Uh, you will have, for the economists, you will Surely you heard of Pareto. That's so often these distributions will be called Pareto distributions, just simply that's a term that's used. Uh, and Pareto studied uh, was wealth, right? Uh, I think in the late 1800s in, in Italy. Yes, I have it here. And this is where you get some of these terms like 80 80 20 rule that 80% of the population, for example, has 20% of the wealth and the flip of that. That's a that's a useful thing, or you know, ninety percent of the work takes ten percent of the time, and ten percent of the right, and ten percent of the time takes is, is ninety percent of the work. People have this sort of very. It's a, it's a way of breaking these things down, but of course, we want to look at the whole distribution over and over again. Yeah, and we know in general people are pretty good at well. You know, statistics is a bad thing for people. <laughs> Means are something we can talk about averages, but standard deviation is like a step too far, right? And okay, so we we want to be able to. Constantly look at distributions and, and uh, you know, not forget what's going on with those. Dismal science, right? Yeah, I always used I, I thought that meant that it was just a, a bad science, but it was um, it was that the predictions or what you know came out of economics, the sort of things they would suggest about humanity were, weren't great. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's do, uh, go through a few more of these little calculations, and you're working through these in the assignment. So this is our prototypical. Uh, power law, we've got this continuous x, there's some uh, scale, x min and x max, we'll call these cutoffs, I think you have a and b in your assignment. Uh, and um, if gamma is not equal to, to 2, then the, you can see there's going to be an explosion here, then uh, this, is, this is what you get out, it's an integral, right, we're just going to put a, an x here and integrate from x min to x max, right, that's the um, mean of a, uh, of give, given a probability distribution. And so the important thing here is that here's the exponent gamma, uh, and the maximum cutoff and the min, the min cutoff are just appearing here, right? That's it. There's no internal scale. There's no thing in between. If we had a, an exponential, for example, then the typical length scale of an exponential would be here. It's exactly right to the mean. So it's just the outsides, and all of these internal scales, they all kind of matter. None of them dominate. That's the really important thing. Uh, and so the mean blows up when you get to gamma equals two. So that's the, as we, as gamma, so as gamma, the way we framed it, right? It's x to the minus gamma. So as gamma is becoming um, smaller than on a log log plot, then the slope is, is becoming less, right? It's going out like this. It's a heavier tail, more stuff out here. So it makes sense that your average is getting bigger and bigger. And as soon as we, when we hit two, then the mean goes uh, becomes dominated by this maximum, and if we have no upper limit here, right, if the, we have an infinite, if x max is infinity, then the mean actually goes to infinity. Um, all right, so 
It depends on the lower cutoff if gamma is greater than 2, right? So both of these things are involved. Um, <coughs> and uh, so when gamma is greater than 2, then this is a negative exponent. This is negative here. This thing is, this x max is relatively large. This tends to be small. So this will be the dominant piece here. The signs will all work out. This is 2 minus a quantity greater than 2. So this is a negative quantity. This is negative. So we get something that, right? This is going to be a small piece. It's only going to depend on that lower cutoff, which is an end of it, right? So typical sample is small. Yes, when gamma is greater than 2, typical sample is large when it's less than 2. And this is just a feel for these things. Many real world distributions, as we've talked about it, are between 2 and 3. And that's where the exciting things, right, I've said these things. This is where the exciting things um, kind of appear. Right. Right. Yes. Between 2 and 3. So in that case, the mean is going to be finite, or it depends on the lower cutoff. The variance is infinite in quotes, right? It means that it's going to depend on the upper cutoff, which, you know, large, large, large thing. Uh, it's going to be, you know, potentially very, very large. So mostly in these cases, you're sampling things, you're getting small things most of the time, and then occasionally you get a big thing, and then even more occasionally you'll get a much bigger thing. So this is a bit of a dangerous situation. These are these wild distributions. So when gamma is greater than three, then you've got a finite mean and a finite variance, and that tends to limit its threat, right, dangerousness of this, this kind of um, distribution. And uh, it still has infinite moments, right, for higher, higher moments, they're infinite. But we're mostly going to be affected by the mean and variance of a distribution if we're sampling from it. Okay. So I want you to get a, you'll get a feel from this as you work through it all. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. Right. So this is, a, this is a piece to point out. So the variance is a, very helpful analytically. There are all sorts of, you know, variances add. This is a good thing. This is a nice feature. So we're, we're going to use it. But potentially, you'd want to actually start with this, right? What's the average that a value is, uh, the average distance of value is away from the mean of, of your variable, right? That would be, and you might have mu here, for example. Um, and that's just an absolute value, right? It's just the distance. That would be easier. So what we do instead is we, we put a square here, and then we take the square root, the root mean square. Has nice mathematical properties. This doesn't, right? This is a messy thing to work with. But it has different scalings if you do that, actually. So this is, this is finite for this thing where the variance blows up. This is a finite quantity. Mean average deviation. Not, it's not used that much because of math. Even though it's the sort of very basic, like, you know, when you just say it, this is fair enough. Like, on average, how far away is our sample from the average? Like how, you know, and if it's just a delta distribution, then it's always there. It's really spread out. You know, this is going to characterize that nicely. We don't do it, but it does have different properties. It's important to, important to set it. All right. Okay. So we're still going to focus on, uh, on uh, variance, of course. All right. This is a very this is a uh, thing we can work on in, in some later assignments. Uh, it's a very nice little problem. So if you so let's say we sample a thousand um, values from this distribution, and then take the maximum, right? And then we go back to the distribution, sample another thousand, take the maximum, do that again, do that again, and then we're going to get a little distribution for the maxima. That has all sorts of beautiful math involved with this. This ex extremal statistics. But you can do some rough things to figure out, typically, how big will this largest value be? And similarly, the smallest one. But we're interested in the largest one. And for power law size distributions, it's, this is the number of samples that you've made. It grows as a power of that number. And so for a Gaussian, right, it's dying away like e to the minus x squared. The largest one, yes, it'll get bigger, but very, 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 very slowly. Right, really slow. It's really you know, constrained. And, Exponentials are really constrained. But these power laws, as you sample, as you sample, you know, and that's where, that's where things like the 100-year flood and the 10-year flood and the 1,000-year flood, those framings, so we have some of this in our general way we talk about, you know, um, a natural phenomena. That's, that's the, probably the best encapsulation of it, which is the sense that, you know, big things, 
bigger and bigger, bigger things will happen over larger and larger time scales. And if it was a Gaussian distribution for flood sizes, we wouldn't have those words, right? And the way we talk about it mostly is that what was a thousand year flood happens every hundred years now or every 10 years. Yeah. But this is going to grow. So for instance, that, that gamma equals two, which is this cusp of a mean being infinite. It's a pretty extreme situation, right? This is actually going to grow like n to the one. One over two minus one is going to grow like n. So the largest one in your sample is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. So if you are thinking you're filling in some distribution, getting lots of samples, if you have a Gaussian, it'll just fill in and you'll start to see. Uh, we'll look at that later on with random walks. You can imagine all these little ball bearings doing random walks and they fall and you count where they end up. You get a nice little normal distribution. Occasionally you get, you know, you have to get all these coins being flipped heads to end up over there, right? You need to get 10,000 in a row to get way over there. But not with these things. So this is an important um, result. Uh, so if you have something like uh, an exponential, as I said, then this is going to grow very slow, like logarithmic growth, very, which is very slow, not really moving. Right? So we sample, sample, sample from our exponential. We will eventually, you know, you get bigger things. You, you have to get bigger things, right? You start to get into the tail more, but it's going to grow very, very slow. All right? So this is a, a good reflection of why this is a dangerous business. Yeah. You can't tell entirely where you're going to be in the future. And if you look at this, if you, if you do the simulations, and maybe I'll have this later, then you'd see this sort of thing for your distribution. You sample more, and it has a tail. It keeps going out like this on, the, on a log-log plot. Right. Keeps filling out the tail. All right, that's good. We have to show that right now. Might come back to that. Okay, so all right, this is a very important thing. So uh, I showed you the other day. It's kind of it can be pretty messy these distributions. The, the one from the Brown corpus, the language one, they can be pretty messy. So when I talked about integrating them to clean them up, and so this is this idea, and we'll use this notation. So this is probably that uh, your sample is greater than x, at least equal to x, and so and you could write it like this if you want. It's uh, the one minus the cumulative distribution. So this is a standard thing in statistics. This is what we'll call a complementary cumulative distribution, sometimes called the exceedance probability. And so simple construction, right? We're going to integrate from our value x to infinity. And so we want, you know, what this is what is the probability that we're at least at x? Right. And again, cumulatives are pretty common. We use them all, all the time, but this is the complementary cumulative. Uh, this is a simple little integration, right? So we're going to there's a constant. We're not worried about this. This is our power law, x to the minus gamma. Text prime, we got a dummy variable. Just integrate that thing. So there's minus gamma plus one up here. Yes. Uh, evaluate at these two pieces. And um, so infinity, this is, this is greater than one. So this is going to disappear. And then we just have x at the uh, bottom end. So if you can see this, this is, a, this is, this is why we you know, choose to do this because we end up with another power law uh, with a different exponent, it's minus gamma plus one. So we've gone from our original probability distribution, which is this x to the minus gamma, the complementary cumulative is x to the minus gamma plus one. And because this is integration, it smooths things out, right? Differentiation breaks things up and makes things messier. Integration will smooth it out. This will give us better data. We can look at this and, and draw straight lines on them. Right? We're trying to do regression to find these exponents and these log-log plots. Generally speaking, it's easier to work in this space. Okay. So uh, it's fine when it's just the tail, right? And um, this is the summary. It just it increases the exponent by one. And so here, here are some plots, right? So here's a PDF, and this is, again, this brown corpus, lots of scatter and so on, right? The was out here. This is the word the. Um, <coughs> It appears about, in this case, what was it? Mm. This is log 10 of Q. This is actually about 6%. And there's only one word that has that frequency of usage. And there are many words that are rare. That's what this piece is. So if you go to each point here and then integrate this way, which is what we did, then you, it smooths out and this exponent has been lifted up by one. And you see it's going to be a little messy in places, right? This is not exactly straight. It's going to be messy out here. There are, there are less points out here, of course. 
but we're going to feel a little bit better about regressing on this thing. It's not super. It's, it's okay. There's not a lot. I mean, there are, what is it? 2.5. There's a couple of orders of magnitude. It's not bad. Just an example. Yep. Yeah, so this is the number, so it's always going to be decreasing. So, so the, the cumulative distribution is always increasing, right? Because it's how many things are less than something. How many things are greater, that's going to go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, it's good. And it's back in, partly in here, right? So this is, this is, this is increasing with x, and it's 1 minus, sorry. This is, the, this is a cumulative distribution. That's something that's monotonic. Yeah, right. One minus means it's going to be, yep, good. Good. So you always, you always expect to see this. Okay. Uh, same surface as a discrete variable. Um, we've just got probability of k. k equals 1, 2, 3. Then usually, usually the game here is we write, we put our, I haven't shown it here, but we always turn sums into integrals. Rough approximation. So that's okay. It's the story here, and we get the same thing. It's rough, but it's the same idea. Same thing holds. All right. All right. You don't need to see bog oracles, but. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right, let's do it. There might be a cat in it. <laughs> let's see what it says. I know it's ridiculous. Let's see what it yeah, there it is. It's been padded. Oh. Zip's law, yes. So, um, and then the cat. Uh, in the background is an ice cream maker, which is actually, it's ice cream, which is this terrible thing that I make, which is um, water, maple syrup, and cashews. That's it. And some maple, and some vanilla. And that makes a really good, um, yeah. It depends if you're a bad person like me. <laughs> but if you have a dairy issue, or you're crazy, then um, you, should, you should eat that. It's really good. So... It's fantastic. Yeah, one and, a half, one and a half cups of cashews, one and a half cups of water, one cup of maple syrup. That's it. <laughs> so Zip, let's talk about Zip. So Zip is a very interesting character in all of this. Uh, he died in 1950, he was only about 50 years old, and he just produced this, this um, work, uh, which we'll come back to. Um, which was out of print for a long time. Now you can get it again. Uh, it was sort of, you could only find it for like $1,000 at, at points. So it sort of kind of went away. But he would, he would be fantastic right now. I mean, the way he talks about data and so on and what might be possible with social phenomena is, is fantastic. Okay, so, uh, so he noted, so he was thinking about language. So he was a linguist. He was an expert, I think, in Chinese uh, at Harvard. And he looked... Part, one of the things he was doing, I, th I think in part, was looking at how uh, kids learned how their vocabulary grew with time. So that was one piece. But then he started to just sort of get excited about everything. So, you know, what are the, what's the distribution of city size? Like how much freight goes between cities in the U.S.? Uh, if, um, you know, articles about other cities in a city, how much do they write about other cities? Just things like that. How long are, in inches, how long are articles in the Encyclopedia Britannica? I mean, this is back in the 30s and 40s and so on. And of course, students were the victims here who had to go and measure things like that with rulers and count and so on. And I do have a piece later on of a, of a comment that, was, uh, that ended up in a New York Times article from a former student. We'll get to that later. Who was, yeah. So I don't know much more about him, but just, just his work. Anyway, so we're going to talk about Zipf's law. So Zipf's way is this. This is a very reasonable natural thing. You've got uh, all of these uh, entities with have different frequencies. So it could be cities, and it's just their populations. It could be the words in a book, and it's how many times they appear. It could be uh, species in a forest, and how many counts of each species. So it could be things like this. So you have sizes, right? And that's what we've been talking about. Um, with these power law sizes, you have sizes of something. You know, how many types of atoms you have in your body. And so this is a simple thing to do. We're going to rank them from largest to smallest. And then just put them on a plot. And so X will be the size of the Rth uh, ranked entity. So 1 is the largest size. We want to make sure that we've got that. Um, 
Could be the frequency of occurrence, right? These are examples. And so Zip's observation was, in general, that this is pretty common, that there's a power law here for this, that these things decay as a power law. Uh, you see this for number of citations for papers, right? The most cited paper going out, which is something to do with protein assays, I think. The first 100, we were talking about how the importance of uh, measurement in science. The first 100 most cited papers, most of them are about instruments and methods, you know, making science possible. Or not. What's that? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's true. <laughs> I mean, you're helping, right? So it's good. Enabling. All right, so something that wasn't noticed for about 50 years or sort of generally understood, which is kind of odd, it's a pretty simple thing, uh, is that these things look pretty similar, right? So this is, okay, so I've said this. So this is zip. This is what ZIP would do for this brown corpus, right? So the word the is the most commonly occurring one. So it just this is just going to be, this is log 10 of them. So it's just going to be ranks across here. So log 10 of 1 is 0. This is the 10th word here. This is the 100th word here and the 1,000th word here. And you're just going to put there frequency of occurrence. So it's a really simple thing to plot. Like, and if you have the data in your, you know, uh, whatever you're using, it's super easy. You just sort it from largest to smallest and then just plot it. Really easy. You don't have to make one of these frequency distributions. So easy to make, they're decreasing, right? They've got to be decreasing or staying constant. Uh, and we can worry about uh, ranks where uh, matching up. Clearly this is truncated, right? This obviously goes out way, way, way out here. And eventually you get to words appearing, the hapax logomena, the words that only appear once in the whole corpus. And then you'd have a whole string of ones that all be sitting at the same height. All right, but that's not, not there. And if you look at this, though, this is the CCDF, the complementary cumulative distribution that we just derived, right? And that is, it looks like a flip of this thing. All right, so V, again, is this little point here. I could make these plots better. V is here, right? That's the same kind of structure here. And that's actually exactly what's going on, right? So these are, an important thing, they are flips of each other. So that's the flip of the zip plot. So, uh, the nice thing then is you can, well, the, these two laws are connected, right? The size distribution, its power law is uh, connected to Zip's law, right? Very famous. People talk about Zip's law in a lot of places. And uh, so let's, let's try to understand why that is. And then we'll get a connection between these two exponents, right? So there's, uh, there's minus gamma, there's, there's um, X, what am I calling? S to the minus gamma for the power law size distribution, and minus alpha was what we'll use for zip. Sorry, flip around. So we'll use this for, for um, zip, zipfian things. Yeah, good. Okay, so we've got this. So we see this and we think, all right, well, let's, let's work through why that is. So we've got this complementary cumulative distribution. So that's the probably that right, our sample is greater than or equal to x. So if you multiply that by the number, this gets it back to a frequency, right? This is the number of objects with size at least x, right? n is the total number of objects. Um, and then that has to be its rank, right? So working back from the other end, or you know, plus 1 or minus 1. So if there are 30 objects bigger than that, then we'll say it's you know, rank 30 or rank 31. And it's greater than or equal to. So it's, it's going to be the right thing. So uh, yeah, exactly. So that so we know this is the rank. So now we've, we're connecting. This is the CCDF connected to the rank. So we can write that down. This is the size according to Zip's law. So this is Zip's law just sitting here, right? That the size of the rth ranked object decays as r to the minus alpha. And we're just going to replace the rank r with this whole blob here, which is from the complementary cumulative distribution. Um, and we know that this beast here has this x to the minus gamma plus 1, right? So it's the minus gamma, we increase it by 1. So we're just going to stick all of that in here. There's a power of minus alpha on the outside. So that's all of this then, x to the r minus gamma plus 1 minus alpha. And what we've got is x to the r is proportional to x to the r to this power. So all of this power has to be 1. So this has to be, right, this blob up here has to be 1. And so this is the connection between... Zip's law and power law size distributions exponent. Uh, power law size distributions and its connection of the exponent. So this is Zip's exponent. So for instance, when gamma is 2, which is this 
dire kind of situation where we've just, we're just at the cusp of the mean of the distribution being infinity or extremely large, then this is going to be 1, right? 1 over 2 minus 1. And 1 is sort of famously what Zipf thought every, all of his Zipf laws were. Not, not all of them. He, he, he thought a lot of things. But he thought a lot of these size rank things uh, were kind of rightly or correctly or by God or something like, he didn't have a reason for these things, right? He had sort of some rough ideas about it, but he didn't have a mechanistic reason. And we'll see in the 50s where reasons start to come out and we have a nice fight about, um, we have a fight that keeps going uh, about why it's, you know, is it randomness? Is it just some sort of simple mechanism or is it optimization? You know, is language just kind of optimize thing? Or is it just some sort of growth mechanism that's producing it or some mixture? And this is not just about language, but cities as well, right? So a city is growing in some sort of random way. Do people just move to New York because they know someone and that kind of helps connect them? How do social networks grow? Lots of, lots of these simple growing things. So this is a very important piece. Uh, and it's easy to measure uh, either, either exponent, uh, but it's easy to work with zip distributions. Really, you've got the data, you just sort it from largest to smallest and plot it, and straight away you can see if you've got a, a, a power law. Anyway, nice thing to know about. Yes, and as I said, gamma equals two is a, these, these are very important kinds of uh, examples or of, um, yeah, Zip's law and, and the power law size distribution ones. Right, okay, so yeah, and out at three, which is the, which is the switch between uh, infinite variance and, and a finite variance, then this is gonna be a half. So Zip's law kind of tends to float up in that case. All right, Zipf's law. So let's talk about Zipf's law a little bit. This is just a funny random one that I'll throw in here for you. Uh, I don't know why that's popping up in my little scripts up here. But so this is took all chess databases. And this is just something completely ridiculous, right? All chess databases and then looked at how many times a specific game was followed out to D steps. And it turns out to be, so you have the number of games of, um, with popular, right? So popularity N. So this is their size. Yeah, and then this is the number of games that have that popularity. So it's like, uh, you know, here's the frequency of a word, and this is how many words have that frequency. The same kind of thing. So we don't have to worry about this too much, right? But if you, yes, it's a little more complicated perhaps, but uh, yeah, nice diff distributions. Here's the piece that I just showed you, right? So it's a decent looking scaling. Uh, and then the nice thing about this was adding a whole uh, kind of, fracturing mechanism story as to why it might come about. We don't have to worry about it too much, but just to show you there's a recent thing, uh, right? So this is, this is the case where every, where every game that starts with this move, then maybe two thirds go in this direction, and then there's a whole splintering over here, and so on, right? But it's a fracturing kind of thing that's happening. It's giving rise to this uneven, uh, <clears throat> Waiting. So this game, the one that follows through to this path, this is the most common one. And then there are these rarer ones over here. And there are many rare ones. There's one that's very common. And, you know, you could think, well, okay, that could just have sort of not a very skewed distribution. But like a lot of these real phenomena where things could grow and uh, build on each other, you tend to have these skewed distributions. All right. This is the last thing for these slides. I want to show you. Um, so we've talked about these, these extreme um, statistics where you know the, the things are falling off the, the end here, right? And this is this is this is for cricket, which you all know about, of course. But uh, so test cricket, where you can score a lot of runs as a batsman in individual innings. That's all you need to know. Having an average of 50 above 50 in test cricket is pretty fantastic, right? Whatever this means. Um, but so this is Don Bradman, who's over here with 99.94. This is pretty weird, right? So you look at all these things like Wayne Gretzky and Michael Jordan and whoever you right. They're going to be here. Fantastic, they're on the edge of the whole thing. But this guy was a complete anomaly. And um, yeah, the English, when they got him out, would, because he's Australian, when they got him out, they would, you know, the, the front of the paper would say, Bradman is out. You know, like when, it, when he came to bat, they would all turn up. So a legend, from the 30s and 40s and wrapped around the Second World War. But this, uh, he, he, uh, he just needed four runs in his final innings to get, have an average of 100, which would have been extraordinary, and he, he made zero, so. <laughs> 99.94. Yeah, anyway, there are great things with, uh, so that's a, that's a pretty weird outlier. And I mean, the games maybe change, but still, very weird. Um, 
Anyway, later on we're going to get uh, you know, to things like fame and success. Why do things take off? Which sort of all connects to this. There's some slides there, but uh, you don't need to see that. Um, okay, that's weird, right? Some systems have weird anomalous things. Now, for city sizes, for example, within countries, it can be that the the capital city is is an outsized thing. It doesn't fit on the like this. It doesn't fit on the distribution. So that that's a um, an interesting piece there too. All right. Okay. Pretty weird. Yeah. So he practiced as a kid. Is that from the bush? He would practice with a cricket stump, which is a round cylinder of wood, against a corrugated tank, which is round this way and then corrugated like this, with a golf ball and hit it against it, and then just keep hitting it. It's basically impossible to hit it once, you know. So, but um, there's this old video of him doing it. A great hero. Anyway, so right. Hmm. Yes. Let's talk about.